Hi, this is Pat Love with Pat's Two Cents. We are God's Church of Love online, meeting every Saturday at 12.15 p.m. Pacific. And we are about to start our message from Isaiah 61. So join us in reading God's word. Father, we ask you to anoint in the name of Jesus, and we bless your name, Father, for what you're doing. The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me, because the Lord hath anointed me to preach good tidings unto the meek. He has sent me to bind up the broken hearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and the opening of the prison to them that are bound to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all that mourn, to appoint unto them that mourn in Zion, to give unto them beauty for ashes, the oil of joy for mourning, the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness, that they might be called trees of righteousness, the planting of the Lord, that he might be glorified. And they shall build the old wastes. They shall raise up the former desolations, and they shall repair the waste cities, the desolations of many generations. And strangers shall stand and feed your flocks, and the son of the alien shall be a plowman in your vine dresses, but ye shall be named the priests of the Lord. Men shall call you the ministers of our God. Ye shall eat the riches of the Gentiles, and in their glory shall ye boast yourselves. For your shame ye shall have double, and for confusion they shall rejoice in their portion. Therefore in their land they shall possess the double, everlasting joy shall be unto them. For I, the Lord, love judgment. I hate robbery for burnt offering. And I will direct their work in truth. And I will make an everlasting covenant with them. Wow, I'm going to stop there. I stopped at verse 8. Now, <clears throat> what came to me as I was reading was God wants to take the ugly the worthless, the nothing, and turn it into a jewel of beauty, priceless jewel of value. And he wants to do that with each and every one of our lives, but check it out. He also, now that also depicted the calling of Jesus. He read from that verse in Luke chapter 4 when he stood up to proclaim his ministry. But check it out. This also depicts who we are to be. This shows you who the church is, how the church is to minister to the church. How the body of Christ is to minister to one another. And I say to you, if, you belong to any church out there that does not minister inner healing, wholeness, comfort, encouragement, edification, correction, empowerment, deliverance. I mean, it's a slew. This is so all-encompassing. Rebuilding the whole man. It even talks about former desolations of old generations, which means re rebuking, reversing, canceling generational curses. This is so all-encompassing. It tells us in detail how God will make us whole and how God will use Jesus through Jesus Christ, through his Holy Spirit, and through us to other people. How God will use his church in like manner. So 
what I say to you is, be mindful how you minister to one another. Be mindful how you talk to one another. You are to edify, not tear down. The only thing that needs to be torn down is the work of Satan, the work of darkness. But when it comes to God's people, we are always to edify one another. And edifying does take, it, I mean, it also includes words of correction, counsel, godly counsel. That's right. Some of you don't want to hear it when somebody tells you that you're unequally yoked with the person you're dating. You get an attitude. But that, too, is part of edifying the body, stopping each one of us from self-destruct, self-destruction, acts of self-destruction. Just like you tell a child not to put his hand on the stove. You're not doing it to be a killjoy. You're doing it to protect which means you want to preserve that child's life and enable them to function to the best of his or her ability. That's part of edifying, protection. Now, I don't want to get off the beaten path. I just want to explain a few little tidbits. When you look at what he said, when he said he was there to preach good tidings to the meek, he sent him to bind up the brokenhearted. Many of us come to the Lord. I would almost dare to say all of us. We come broken. We come damaged. We come sin sick. We come to him bound. We come to him jacked up, toe up from the flow up. I know I love that expression and I wear it out, but love me anyway. Okay. We come to God as a mess. A misconglomeration of a mess. Now, if I said that incorrectly, forgive me. But listen, you guys, God is there to put us back together again. I know you've heard that old song. The potter wants to put you back together again. Now, sometimes when you need to fix something as a mechanic, you have to bring it apart, piece by piece. Take parts out, remove parts, disconnect. I mean, totally dismantle the thing. I used to watch my father fixing his neighbor's TV. Back in the day when TVs were filled with all these tubes. <laughs> yeah, and, and electrical components, wiring, and he used to pull out a solder machine and but he would disconnect things in order to put it back together. He'd have to take all the tubes out and test each tube to see which one worked and which one didn't work. So he'd know which one to replace. But he had to dismantle in order to do that. Well, there are times God must dismantle your life and my life. He may have to dismantle you or me. But he's got to do some dismantling because there's been too much damage done. Rust needs to be removed. Cor corrosion needs to be cleaned off. There's a lot of things that need to be cleaned before he can put us back together again. And most of us spend the first part of our walk with God in the cleansing, purifying, the purging process, which we often hate because it's the hardest adjustment to go from sin to holiness. But that's part of what God does in our lives. A major part. Have you ever considered trying to make a connection between two items with a bonding element and the bonding element is pure, and one item is pure, but the other item is not. The older item is contaminated with oils, with corrosion, with, with debris. Well, if you don't clean that old item and you try to make that attachment, the bond will fail or it will be very weak. 
and it won't be able to sustain any kind of stress. Are you getting me? I'm coming up with analogies. They're popping in my head. So you have to allow God to clean you up so that as he removes and replaces with new, you bond beautifully. But if you don't help God, work with God to remove the old debris out of your life, old sins, bad habits, funky attitudes, foul mouth, whatever the case may be, slave mindset, sick, uh, 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 codependent personality, whatever your sickness and, 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 and fallacy is. If you don't remove the unclean thing, when God begins to add to you, things won't stick that he's trying to impart into your spirit because there are too many contaminants you are allowing in your life and as long as you're allowing those contaminants in your life the bonding that god's trying to do in your life the new thing he's trying to create in your life won't stick and before you know it you'll be back to your old ways and god will be a thing of history in your life and you'll be mad at him because in your mind he failed you when in, in all essence you failed to work with him Faith without works is dead. Now, if I tell you as a child, go in the room, get your shoes, put your shoes on, and you go and put your shoes on, like I, you know, like I told you, but you fail, you fail to latch it, you fail to press the Velcro belt across it, you fail to tie up your lace, however that shoe is to be secured in order to stay on your foot without falling off or tripping you up. If you fail to do that part, you put yourself in danger. So you must do your part after you put your shoe on. You must tie your shoe up. Secure it. Or come to mommy or daddy and ask them to do the rest. Get help doing it. But get about doing it. Because if you don't, you're either going to fall, twist your ankle, you're going to trip over something, the shoe's going to come off, you may step on something, cut your foot, whatever. See, when God puts things in you, when God does a work in us, it is to be a permanent work, a secure work. And these are the things God does in each and every one of us. He preaches good tidings to the meek. He binds up the brokenhearted, which means he'll heal your broken heart. He'll take all those hurts out if you let him. Hmm. Proclaim liberty to the captives, which means he will set you free, baby. The opening of the prison to them that are bound. What are you bound with? What are you tied up in knots with? Tied up, tangled up, messed up. What are you hooked on to? To proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord and the day of vengeance of our God. Now see, that's the one component a lot of churches leave out. Is that God is, he's a God of love. He's a God of healing. He's a God of mercy. But he's also a God of judgment. And if you say it in the street form, you say, hey, homie, don't play. You don't play with God. <clears throat> to comfort all that mourn. You know, some of y'all live half your lives in mourning. You're mourning that old lover that you knew in high school. You're living your life in the past, driving 
as you stare at the rear view mirror, focusing on the good old days, quote unquote. You're so busy focusing back there, you can't enjoy what you got in the here and now. Mourning, living a life of mourning. Talking about you wish you could go back to then. It wasn't that great back then either, especially if you didn't have God. But you know how they say, uh, uh, what is it? Distance or time makes the heart grow fonder. Yeah. The further away you get from something, somehow the prettier it seems like it was. All right. Now, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. I read that. To appoint unto them that mourn in Zion. So now there's that ministry to that mourning. God begins to separate you and allow you to bury that thing, bury the hatchet, release it, let it go once and for all. Leave it alone. Let it die already. But God has to help you do that, which he does. He'll give us beauty for ashes. Beauty for ashes. Isn't that something? Some of y'all live your life in an ash heap. Everything's negative. Everything's ugly. Everything's hateful. Everything's hopeless. Everything's full of despair. Everything is dark. Everything is depressing. Everything is a loss. Everything is a waste. Ashes, ashes. Everything is dead, done, gone, sorry, pitiful. Everything is bad in your mind. And God knows what that comes from, and he can heal that too and give you beauty for ashes, give you something to rave about, give you something to, to celebrate for that you never could celebrate before with. But God will enable you to celebrate your life rather than mourn and regret it. So he'll give you beauty for ashes. He'll give you the oil of joy for mourning, the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness. How many of you are clinically depressed? You're just heavy. Life is a burden. Getting up in the morning is a burden. It's an arduous task. And you just don't want to endure. You don't want to undertake it. You don't want to open your eyes. It just gets to be hopeless and useless. And you're heavy and everything's a burden. And every problem weighs more than it really does because you're feeling every inch of it, every ounce of it, and it's all on you. When the Bible says casting all your care on him, because he cares for you. When the Bible says Jesus, as Jesus quotes, he says, take my yoke upon you, for I am meek and lowly of heart. My yoke is easy, 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 and my burden is light, light, not heavy, light. But you fail to take his yoke. You carry your own. You don't cast your cares on him. Then you blame him for how bad you feel. That they might be called trees of righteousness, the planting of the Lord, that he might be glorified. Now, I love this right here because God... He helped me do this in my life big time. As far as healing the brokenhearted, oh, he did me big time. And also building the old waste. And they shall build the old waste. Wow, they shall raise up the former desolations. There are things in your life you think are a lost cause. You think, well, you know, you'll never get back. But see in Joel, it says, I will restore to you the years that the locusts have eaten. Mm, mm, mm. Oh, and something's eaten and consumed is gone. 
But God is saying he will restore all that to you. Mm. Nothing you've lost that can't be restored one way or another. He'll restore it by bringing it back or he'll restore it by replacing it with something 10 times better. Again, you've got to be willing to let it go so you can receive the new. Mm, mm, mm. Wow. Verse 7 says, for your shame, you shall have double. I can't tell you the things I had to fight through, the guilt and the shame. I had to keep taking to the Lord till he delivered me from it. Stuff I did in my days of sin. Mm, mm, mm. Therefore, in their land, they shall possess the double. Everlasting joy shall be unto them. There's an old song that used to minister to my heart because I knew how full of turmoil and how dark I felt and empty I felt all my life. And I always had turmoil. No matter what I was doing, that turmoil was like a dark shadow that followed me everywhere. And I couldn't get rid of it. And the song was, uh, Joy unspeakable and full of glory, full of glory, full of glory. It is joy unspeakable and full of glory. Oh, the half has never yet been told. I have found a joy no tongue can tell, living in the realm of grace. It is like a great overflowing well springing up within my soul. Anyway. It, that's the way I felt. It was like the difference of night and day. From emptiness and nothingness and I'm feeling fulfilled and gratified and satisfied and full of this joy. It's like, oh my goodness, I'm just excited about being alive. I feel alive for the first time in my life. All of that was happening. That's what God does. That's a touch from God. Now, what I say to you, is not only will God do that to you, he will not only do that for you, and he will not only do that in you, God will do it through you as you minister to other people. He will use you to build the old ways. He will use you so he can heal the brokenhearted through you. He will use you to set the captives free. He will use you so he can give beauty for ashes. Because once you have it done for you, you can operate from the standpoint of authority. I know in whom I have believed because he did it for me. I know he can do it for you. Now, will you draw close enough to him to experience all that Isaiah 61 has to offer you through Christ Jesus? Will you draw close enough and be obedient and give everything up for him so he can freely, fully work in you? Now, I'm going to share this. It's still coming to my mind like this. So I got to share it like this. God is showing me my father sitting in the living room, working on that TV, the neighbor's television. How much more difficult would that have been? Mm, mm, mm. If the neighbor said, you got to come over my house and work on my TV at my house. How much more difficult would that have been when all my father's tools were at his house? It would have taken way longer. It would have been more cumbersome because he would have had to have scheduled the time to get over there because he worked full time as a moving man. 
He could only do that in his spare time. The only way he could get the television fixed more quickly, more thoroughly, have all his tools at his disposal whenever he needed them, was to have the television sitting in his own apartment where he lived. How many of you are not willing to give your all to Jesus so he can work on you full time, round the clock, 24 seven? You give him a piece of you on the weekend. You want him to work on you at your convenience. No, it doesn't work like that. You want God to work on you, baby. You got to give up your schedule. God may tell you, I want you to stay home. Don't go to the movies tonight. Don't go to the restaurant. Don't hang out with your buddies. I got to do a work in you. Sit at home. And you may not know that he's got a divine appointment made up for you where he's getting ready to get deep and you need the Kleenex and you need the handkerchiefs. You need to turn off everything so you're not interrupted and God can do that work. Let me share an experience where he did it for me. Some of you have heard this before. So take a coffee break if you don't want to hear it again. I was in my living room asking God why a snide remark that wasn't that important bothered me so much. I couldn't shake it. And if you ever have something like that, take it to God. Don't ignore it. Don't slough it off and work over it like it doesn't count. It counts. If God's allowing it to haunt you, it's a reason. I happen to ask God why. I didn't expect an answer, but I got one. God spoke to me and said, rejection. From that point on, I, and I'm asking God, get it all out at the root. I don't know what's going on. I don't know what, how that has to do with rejection. I couldn't even see it. But I said, but Lord, you said it, so handle it. Please take it out. All of it. All of it. What did I say that for? I ended up two hours howling, crying, sobbing, whimpering, and dry heaving for over an hour and a half. Dry heaving, y'all, that takes a lot out your body. It was like I was constantly throwing up, throwing up, throwing up. Nothing was coming up but a bunch of noise. And I could feel the emotional pain welling up every time. All this emotional pain welling up, coming out. Now, some of y'all think you can do pain management, so you get those feelings and you shove it down and ignore it. No, that's what you take to God. That's what God wants. He wants that crap that you don't know what to do with because he can take it up and take it out and you don't have to deal with it anymore for the rest of your life. But will you ever sit your behind down, take the time and let God deal with it even if it hurts you emotionally while you're going through it so you can be set free After that hour and a half, I just whimpered. I felt like I had lost 100 pounds of weight. And what ended up happening, the Lord commanded me in my spirit to stand up and praise him. And he had me play certain songs. He popped them in my head. Play this song. Play that song. And I didn't know them by heart. So I just played them out of obedience. And boy, those songs ministered to me. That was part of the ministry he was doing to me. When I got through Baby Cakes, I was a brand new saved person. I was already saved 15 years before that happened. But God had to get deep to get that one. And he got it at the root. And that rejection started from my mother. See, those deep-seated things that you get as a child, those things cut deep. 
So when stuff bothers you, sometimes the best thing to do is not complain about it, but ask God why and whatever it is, show it to you and get it out. Then you set yourself up to be delivered and healed and freed up a lot quicker. Leave yourself in, in the living room of God. Don't have God have to come to you at your convenience. You keep yourself in his presence at all times like the neighbor that left the TV in my father's living room. He left the TV in my father's living room for days, sometimes weeks. But when the thing was fixed, it was fixed. Some of y'all don't want God to mess with you till you sit up in a Sunday building or Saturday building, however you do your worship. You sit up there in church and you think that does it. You paid your little dues, you paid your little tithes and your little offerings, and you gave God audience for an hour or two, and you're done. Now you're back to business as usual. No, your behind needs to stay in God's presence all day, every day, all week, all night, even in your sleep. Present your bodies a living sacrifice unto God, holy and acceptable, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. That's Romans chapter 12, 1 and 2. You leave yourself with him. You present yourself and you leave yourself there with him. So he can do what he wants to do with you when he wants to do it. But when your life is yours and your agenda is yours and your schedule is yours and God can't break your schedule, it's going to take years to do what he can do in one night. How long do you want to suffer through this stuff? I'm pausing for the cause. I want y'all to think about this. I want it to sink in. Are you going to God to fix you? Or are you going to God for a fix? You just want a quick fix. A good pick me up, a good shot in the arm and you're off to the races. So you go to God at your convenience. Or does God have your audience 24-7? Are you his captured audience? Where if he says, stop and steal away, I need you right now. Are you willing to drop everything and go and see what he wants to do with you? I'm really feeling this. I'm, it's so strong in me right now. I really wasn't sure which direction this was going in. I really thought this was going to be God showing us how to minister to other people. But it's as if God is saying, you're forgetting who I am in your life. You want me to wipe your tears. You want me to put money in your pocket and fix all your problems. But your biggest problem and your biggest issues are the ones you don't come to me for. You don't even address. You don't even look at. Because you're so busy doing your life that you forget to let me handle you. And you don't even know how I will handle you. You don't even know what I'll do to you because half of you ain't even in that word. You haven't even gotten to know what I want to do inside of you. Well, this is Pat talking now. I know a lot of you don't read. And some of you don't like to read. I know I don't, except when I'm reading the word. So I know, I understand that part. But the only way you're going to get to know what God wants to do in your life, you got to read this. Some of you have never heard this, this chapter and verse before. So you never knew that God wanted to do this in you. Never heard it across the pulpit. 
Some of you may have, you might have been too busy playing on your cell phone to know what the preacher was talking about. You did God a favor by sitting in church, and that's about as far as that went. But I want you to hear what God is saying he'll do in your life. And I'm a witness. I'm an eyewitness. Because God did a lot of this in my life. So I'm not reading a textbook. I'm reading something that I already believe in because I live this. And I'm still living it. And I'll live this till the day I die. Because no matter how jacked up you are, baby, you are not too hard of a job for God to tangle with. You may be an impossible dream to yourself, but not God. With God, all things are possible. So I admonish you. I encourage you. Go to God. Your diaper's dirty. Go to God. You have incontinence. You can't control your movements. Go to God. And when I say that, the Bible refers to the lack of self-control and out an out-of-control temper as incontinence. In the natural form, incontinence means you need a diaper because you can't control your pee or your poop. But in the spiritual sense, it refers to your not being able to control your emotions. Ask God questions about yourself. You don't know you. God does. Why do you get so angry when that happens? Don't just feel justified. Ask God, why does that bother me so much? When I asked God that, when I went off one day in my living room, three months after I was saved, God spoke back to me. He said one word. He's not a blabbermouth, but he will answer your questions when they're pertinent. I said, Lord, why do I get so angry? Why do I go off like that? What did he say to me? Rage. My reaction was, moi? Rage? Are you serious? Rage? I got rage in me? I was actually surprised, y'all. Why? He knows me better than I know myself. Don't think you know yourself all that well, because you don't. Most of you, most of you individually, most of you, the individual, is a puzzle to you. And you only have pieces of the puzzle. God knows it all. He knows how each piece of the puzzle got shaped like that. He knows every chapter and every moment, every hour, every incident in your life that caused this, that, and the other to turn out the way it did in you. He knows why you're so uh, task-oriented. He knows why you live your life proving what a wonderful person you are. He knows what, what brokenness is in you that causes you to have to overachieve. He knows what causes you to give up. He knows what causes you to go off. He knows what causes you to be so easily offended. But if you ain't never going to him to ask, you're going to be like that for the rest of your life. So I ask you, how bad do you want him to minister to you? How bad do you want to change? You want to be a, an emotional cripple for the rest of your life. You want to be lame for the rest of your life. You want to be half blind for the rest of your life. Dull of hearing. Can't, can't recognize when a person's giving you good counsel because that can't, they can't be talking about me. I'm flawless. No, no, you're not. Let me show you this and then I'm done. This right here is a diamond. All of these are diamonds, and they are what this is a diamond with inclusions, inclusions and fractures, or whatever you call them, all kind of stuff that's in there. 
that dulls the, the uh, brilliance. Picture yourself as that diamond. That's how you, you really come to God in the rough. Okay, here's a diamond in the rough. That's how some of you come to him. You come on with all kind of chips and scratches and dents and you look like a crumpled up piece of stainless steel. I mean, you know, crumpled up piece of aluminum foil. You're just all bent up and, 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 and crinkled. But God said he will go ahead of you and make the rough places smooth and the crooked places straight, right? Now, let's move that. That's the... That's what you call the diamond in the rough. That's how we come to him. Now, this is how we come. Now we're saved, but we got all this mess in us. Now, we think we're going to be saved and look like this diamond down here, all brilliant and shiny. No, baby. That takes years to get to that. Decades. No, we're like this right now. We're saved. He shaped us. He has reshaped us. But we are definitely not who we're supposed to be. He's got to remove all these inclusions. Let me blow this picture up real quick so you can really get a picture. Look at all those inclusions there. He's got to get rid of all those inclusions and all these clouds. And This is what you call a cloudy diamond, and that's what makes it cloudy. All the imperfections, all the, all the marred areas. You can refer to this as scar tissue, emotional scars. That's what we're loaded with when we come to God. As he works on us and works on us and works on us, we become more like this diamond right here. This is going to be on video for those of you who can't see it now. See how crystal clear that is? This is a 60 something thousand dollar two carat diamond. So you know this baby is practically flawless to cost that much. Beautiful, brilliant. Imagine how it dazzles in the light, how it sparkles and reflects all from all of the facets. You got to get cleaned up and polished up by God to be that. You can live like this diamond and think you're all that in a bag of chips. Look at how much bigger it is than this one is to the right. The one here on the right, this one is the one that's priceless compared to this. This one here is big, but it ain't worth that much. It's got too many flaws. You see, God increases your worth as he cleanses you, as he purges you, as he purifies you, as he heals you. The potter wants to put you back together again. Do you want him to put you together? Or do you want to make an excuse for being toe up from the flow up? You got a right to be angry. You got a right to resent. You got a right not to forgive. You have a right to cuss somebody out. You have a right. You ain't got a right, baby. You're not your own. You were bought with a price, the blood of Jesus. Now you're going to present your body as a living sacrifice to God, or are you going to only allow him to come over on appointment times only? Because you don't want him messing with your schedule and messing with your agenda. How's it going to be with you? Because God's not going to be your part-time lover. He wants to be your full-time physician, your full-time counselor, your full-time healer, your full-time lifter up of your head. What do you want him to be? How do you want him? You're the one that determines it, not him. I pray you make the decision to give him full access. Even when you don't want to deal with him, you'll deal anyway. And get your healing and get your freedom. God bless you as you go to him.